Professor Bohr, thanks so much for your time um, to talk about the topic of euthanasia. The Netherlands was the first country in the world to permit voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide. Can you give us a brief outline of the law and its application today in the Netherlands? Uh, yes, we have a law that uh, uh, that has a number of, of uh, criteria and the first of, first of them is the patient should be absolutely sure that he or she wants to have assisted dying. Secondly, there should be unbearable suffering. Uh, thirdly, the suffering cannot be relieved in another way. Uh, fourthly, uh, um, uh, another doctor should have seen the patient. And last but not least, uh, the, the euthanasia should take place in a medically sound manner. Can you outline the typical procedure that's followed from the point at which a person requests euthanasia in the Netherlands? Uh, yes, well, in most cases normally the patient would have indicated before to his doctor uh, his, his viewpoint on assisted dying. Um, uh, so that means that a, a doctor will know uh, from years of experience how the patient thinks about these matters. However, when the patient gets sick, normally uh, the doctor will start a conversation, why do you want it? Um, uh, if the doctor becomes convinced that this is a serious uh, matter, a serious candidate for euthanasia, he will ask the help of a second doctor. It will take about between three months and, and I think two or three weeks uh, normally. For nearly 10 years, you were a member of the Regional Euthanasia Review Committee in the Netherlands. What's the role of that organisation? Uh, well, we have five regional review committees. Uh, they are in place because um, it indicates that assisted dying is not a normal procedure. It needs to be uh, reviewed uh, after the fact, uh, not before, but after the fact, by three people, a lawyer, an ethicist, um, and a physician, and they together will decide whether the, the case was enacted according to the law. So what sort of trends did you see in the Netherlands in terms of the number of people choosing to opt for euthanasia? Well, that's a very important question because uh, in the first years after the law was uh, was accepted in, in 2001, the first years there was a, a stabilization of the numbers. On a yearly, yearly basis it was about 1,800 uh, re reports. Uh, those uh, numbers remained stable until 2006 and then we concluded actually that the law was a great success. Uh, after 2006 the numbers started rising for, for unknown reasons. They still need to be uh, reviewed why they went up so fast because we are now up I think about 250 percent in comparison to 2002. What sort of medical conditions um, do the people who are accessing euthanasia have? Uh, the typical medical condition is, is cancer in a terminal stage. That was in the beginning about 95 percent of the cases. Uh, now that has gone back to about I guess about 70-75% of the cases and the rest of the illnesses are more complex like dementia or uh, psychiatric uh, conditions or, uh, or, or uh, ALS or even uh, people being tired of life. Um, rationale is one that's um, quite new and, and unusual to an, to an Australian audience. What does that actually mean, tired of life? While tired of life, it has to be said, no person is, is only tired of life when he is healthy. So, so m typically these are uh, accumulated uh, age-related diseases such as hearing or seeing badly, uh, being in, becoming immobile and dependent, um, uh, incontinent. And I, I, you see when people have a number of these uh, complaints, um, these together add up to the conclusion that they don't want to go on uh, living anymore, uh, but they could have gone on, on living for, for, for years. Really. Do you think that patients who are choosing euthanasia um, are clear about the difference between palliative care and euthanasia? I think most people are. I mean, there is some confusion, of course. If people think, for example, that palliative sedation is a kind of euthanasia, which is, isn't. Normally it isn't. Uh, what you can see in the Netherlands is that palliative care has become better, actually, in the past years. Uh, just like in Belgium. Uh, that is the good news. The, the, the concerning thing is that this hasn't led to a decrease in the numbers. What I see, my impression, is that 
people, uh, after a good trajectory of palliative care, uh, people want uh, euthanasia anyway. So it's the palliative care is not enough, simply. Mm. Do you think there's any danger that by legalising the option of euthanasia, um, we reduce the pressure to put effort into providing the best care possible for people with life-limiting illness? Um, I think countries like Belgium and the Netherlands are very much aware of this international um, uh, argument that, that when they have this right to die law that the palliative care will get worse. So, uh, so they have done a lot to make the palliative care better. But as I said, the, the increase of palliative care has not led to a decrease in the number, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. In Australia, there seems to be confusion about the use of, drug, use of drugs to, to manage pain, and you referred to it previously in, in terms of palliative sedation. Um, is that a concern that is, is shared in the Netherlands? Uh, <clears throat> there is some reason for concern, but uh, you can say that in any country, and, and, and in the Netherlands, there is a grey zone where uh, administering drugs uh, for, for palliative reasons uh, can, 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 can amount to uh, an, a death that is uh, hastened. So there's a grey zone where people uh, are killed without their wishes, but this number fortunately is going down. What safeguards are in place to protect vulnerable people from seeking euthanasia, for example people who are uh, living with depression? Um, I think my concern is that the safeguards for protecting people from having euthanasia uh, are, are not very well in place. I mean, on the one hand, there's of course a whole, uh, a whole circuit of, of, of care for people with depression, uh, trying to keep them from having suicide. On the other hand, there's an increasing number of doctors, especially the uh, end-of-life clinics, uh, a clinic which helps people with psychiatric illnesses and um, which do not provide the necessary um, arguments against committing this. Mm. And is that a change that's been brought about by the legalization of euthanasia that, um, you know, a, a different feeling about people's right to, to choose to die if they are suffering from depression? Uh, I think definitely the fact that there is a law has now in the long run meant that our resolve to help people coping with their depression, uh, our resolve is now under, under pressure. You can see that really because mo most of the documentaries, for example, that we have seen in the Dutch television in the past 10 years, uh, they tend to highlight the suffering of the people and then their right to, to have uh, euthanasia. Uh, and almost never there is a real focus on the reasons or the ways we can help them to cope and, and the reasons we have, can help each other to cope with difficult circumstances. Who actually carries out euthanasia in the Netherlands? Is it GPs or specialists? Uh, <clears throat> it is generally a GP, GPs. I think it's about 90-95% uh, general practitioners and, and only in hospitals or for nursing homes is a very, very small percentage. Um, do GPs who are asked to perform euthanasia, are they required to seek specialist support if the, the person making the request has particular complex pain or symptom management needs? I think this is one of the weaknesses of the Dutch system, and that is that in our law we do not have any requirement that, that uh, the J JP has to uh, to seek specialized palliative care. So that means that some, J some, some ph physicians do know the access to palliative care. Other physicians really know only how to use the most simple uh, measures um, without having uh, access to the best specialized palliative care. Do you think that the introduction of euthanasia has changed the relationship between doctors and patients? Uh, yes, yeah, I think what you can definitely see is that uh, the, the availability of euthanasia in the form of a law has led to, to a new dynamic in which uh, euthanasia, from being a last resort, uh, 
that has now become kind of a, 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 an almost a patient's right, not officially, but pa many patients conceive it in that in, in those terms, which means that they they have claims uh, in, in relationship to their doctors, and that changes the relationship, of course. Is it mandatory for doctors to report all cases of euthanasia in the Netherlands? Uh, yeah, re reporting any every case of, of uh, euthanasia is absolutely mandatory. So. Uh, I think we have, uh, at this moment, about 90-95% of all cases are reported. We understand that our end of life choices have recently been established in the Netherlands. How do these clinics work um, and does that indicate a reluctance by doctors to be involved in euthanasia directly? Yeah, it's a very important uh, matter. We have um, uh, uh, one, by the way, one end of life clinic. It's uh, it is in the Hague, but they are not a clinic in the sense that they have beds. Mm -hmm. What they do send out is they send out teams of a doctor and mostly a nurse, and they travel all over the Netherlands visiting patients who who like to seek euthanasia. Um, the patient uh, typically. Um, is visited between two and four times. Uh, I think the, um, the, the the period between asking for uh, the euthanasia or, or the, the, the first contact and the euthanasia is about uh, two to five months. The important thing is that this clinic uh, is especially uh, helping patients that will not be helped by their own doctors. But the doctors, the, the JPs for example, they actually, some of them do prefer the end of life because it saves them the very in, uh, emotional act of having to perform euthanasia. What impact has the introduction of euthanasia and um, the practice of euthanasia by GPs, how has that affected um, GPs in their professional lives? Um, well, normally, I mean, in a normal patient doctor relationship, you go through many difficulties together, uh, including the birth of your children and, and, and sickness and, uh, and depression. And, and then also, uh, a request for euthanasia may come in quite naturally. Um, so, so that means that the typical doctor patient relationship. Uh, it has a possibility for euthanasia, but a normal doctor will not do it more often than once or twice a year because it's a very hard thing to do. The special thing with the end-of-life clinic doctors is that they do not have a patient-doctor relationship before the euthanasia request. So their, their patient relationship is very, very one-dimensional. And together, in a sense, they swim into a tunnel of euthanasia where there's no other options. There have been some cases of family pressure to opt for euthanasia that have been recorded. How does the Netherlands safeguard people who might be in a situation where family pressure um, influences decision making around euthanasia? Well, that's very hard to tell because, uh, of, co of, of course, uh, one of the requirements in the, in the freedom to ask for euthanasia is that uh, a patient should be totally under, without pressure from the, the relatives. So if there's any pressure, that means that, uh, that doctors will have to resist that pressure. Uh, what you see, however, is that some pressure is being internalized by patients, and, and you can well imagine that patients want to save their relatives from the pain and the hurt to see your beloved die and suffer. So the, 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 the pressure, so to speak, is internalized, and it's very hard um, to tell exactly whether this was an undue pressure. We've seen data from Belgium indicating that about 2% of deaths are now due to euthanasia with the consent of the patient. Uh, and in 2010, a study in Flanders found that almost as many, 1.8% of deaths, were due to euthanasia without the explicit consent of the patient. Is there any evidence that doctors in the Netherlands are hastening the deaths of some patients without explicit consent? Yes, there have been done uh, um, uh, independent re reviews and actually the, diff the situation between the Netherlands and Belgium is very different because uh, indications here are that, uh, that really only um, about 10% of all deaths 
it still is a considerable number, it's about 500 a year out of 5,000, uh, are, are the end of ending of life without the explicit request. But this number is going down and it is far lower than the Belgian numbers. Is there a danger um, in your experience having sort of seen a euthanasia le legislation operating in Holland for, for some 10 years that over time euthanasia doesn't become a personal choice but becomes experienced as a, a duty to die, that people feel pressured to relieve burden of others, the burden of their care? Is that something that concerns you? Yes, it does concern me. Uh, however, there's, uh, there's still uh, the, the paradigm, the, you know, the, the the, the most important moral principle is autonomy here and, and still you do see that there's some societal pressure. One of the uh, a well-known Dutch journalist Herbert van Lumen has written a book which is called uh, He Could Better Have Been Dead, which is about his friend, his, his partner, who died of a brain tumor and he says that everybody in his uh, surroundings was uh, indicating that this friend, why, why didn't he get euthanasia? This may be an, an, uh, an, an ex exceptional case, but they do occur and each and every case of them is very concerning. Do you have any um, advice for communities such as the community in Victoria that is now looking at um, the potential of the legalisation of euthanasia? euthanasia, what should we be concerned about, what should we think about in, in, a, in looking at this question? Uh, well, for any country seeking the possibility to have some form of assisted dying, whether it's euthanasia or assisted suicide, it's very important to realise that a law, and that has been proven in, in Holland and, and Belgium, a law creates its own dynamics. Uh, I think uh, the supply of assisted dying does it in fact also stir the demand. So you cannot say that that legalizing this is the end of a discussion, rather it's, it's the beginning of new discussions. Um, especially the right to die advocates, uh, they consider the legalization of some form of euthanasia merely as a stepping stone towards more, more, more uh, liberal practices. So don't think that this will be the end of a discussion, it will only start more discussions. Mm. And has that been the experience in the Netherlands, that you started with quite a confined um, set of circumstances where people could access euthanasia and that's actually grown over time? Uh, yes, yeah, that's the experience. The experience is that, that the context of, of the euthanasia law, and we have talking about the 80s and the 90s, the context was um, uh, unbearable suffering in the context of, of, uh, of cancer or other terminal diseases. Uh, what you see now is that this context is, is very, very much uh, broadened into many other discussions like about dementia, people uh, who are depressed, people who have, for example, autism, uh, people who lose their partner. Uh, who has cancer and, and, and they say, I don't want to go on myself. So all, all kinds of developments uh, clearly have occurred. Have your personal views about euthanasia changed in the more than a decade that you've spent um, observing this space and working in this space? Um, no, they haven't. What, what has, uh, I've always had the opinion that in exceptional cases I could uh, sustain the wish to have an active death. However, what has changed is that I was in the beginning convinced that a euthanasia law in the way we had it in the Netherlands would be a, a respectful compromise offering sufficient safeguards for a stable and transparent um, situation. That view has changed. I think actually what I've seen is the, 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 the the presence of a euthanasia law in itself has communicated its own dynamics and it's a very, uh, a very, it's, it's, a, it's a road with no visible end. We will not, we still don't know where we will end up. What do you see is the future for the legislation in the Netherlands? Where do you think you, where, the, where is that road taking you? Uh, that's very hard to say. I think one of the things is that we, we still have to start to allow a serious discussion about the reasons for the incredible increase in the numbers and, and, and reasons for euthanasia. 
uh, and and we have to start a discussion whether this is desirable, whether this is what we meant when we started this whole uh, euthanasia law. Uh, if you consider that that one out of 25 deaths in the Netherlands is now the, is the consequence of, of active killing, um, I think the question is: Do we want this? Um, I cannot tell what the consequences will be because once you have a law that allows assisted dying, I think it's very very hard to to make restrictions in hindsight. In most hospices in the Netherlands. Uh, euthanasia is not practiced, um, but there are some where it is an exceptional option. Um, but I think most hospices offer so much good care actually that the people residing there uh, do not really have a euthanasia wish. The question should not only be: Do we want? Uh, ca can we do better palliative care? The question also should be: Do we? What really want a society and especially a government to facilitate the killing of its citizens. It does not work because someone is choking or you know somebody is, is, is extremely depressed. Um, but that for me is still no reason why we should legalize the assisted dying because I think um, a society should really protect life and, and um, you see so we cannot uh, we cannot organize tragedy in all its facets. We shall have to, we have to learn to live with the fact that some bear, some suffering may be and remain unbearable. It's hard to say that to the individuals and the, and their families that are experiencing right. that. Right. Um, but certainly, when you look at the the bigger picture, it's um it's a a very very enormous shift that we're thinking about making, and we should be very serious yeah. in making that decision. Exactly. What, what I think I, uh, I can imagine individual patients wanting to die. Uh, I can imagine and I don't resent them. What I do think is, uh, and even, I can even imagine that, that I at some point may be struck by some terrible disease and want to prevent my children from seeing it. Uh, however, I simply do think that it's, it's undesirable to have this organized on a, on a level with the government. Uh, would, would facilitate it because of the many side effects. Yes, there's been a discussion here about whether if euthanasia is euthanized, uh, it legalized, we can actually have it provided outside the medical system and outside the health system to somehow create that separation. Do you think that's a feasible approach? Uh, I wish we, we would have done that, yes. Don't have doctors do it. Let doctors provide all the palliative care and comfort and coping strategies that you can find. But don't bother the doctors with the duty because it becomes a duty. Don't bother them with the duty uh, to kill their patients. Thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure and very informative.